So today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our new dinosaur track site that we have in the Moab area called the Mill Canyon Dinosaur Track Site. Has anybody been there? A few people. All right. If you haven't been there yet, I hope by the time we're done, you'll want to come down and see the site. So I work for the Bureau of Land Management and I help manage public lands. And with the Bureau of Land Management, a lot of people often think, you know, we, we, we help with cows and there's a lot of um, oil and gas or mineral leasing or sage grass and people riding their mountain bikes all over the place. But we also have a lot of fossils on BLM land. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some tracks today. Then the talk right after me, Alan Titus is gonna tell you about some of the fossils from Grand Staircase. And so lots and lots and lots of fossils on public lands. So when you think of the Bureau of Land Management, everybody kind of thinks like, oh, the Park Service has all these people that work for them, right? Well, these are all of the BLM paleontologists in the world. <laughs> There's not very many of us. There's eight, and poor Harley here is retiring next week. So we'll be, we'll be down one. Um, and we have a new guy in, in New Mexico that's not on this list. But so we're really lucky because we get to work on some of the best lands in America, I think, are all of our public lands that belong to all of us here. And in Utah, we're really, really lucky because we have, as we've been hearing today, this really great rock record in Utah that preserves just the right age rocks, and we don't have a lot of vegetation, which is perfect for finding fossils. So the area that I work in is down here inside this pink box, and I live in Moab, but I get to work all in this area here. And we just happen to have the right age rocks exposed, as far as I'm concerned, the Mesozoic. And we have lots and lots of Mesozoic rocks. And the track site that I'm going to be telling you about today is from the um, early Cretaceous. So the talk that Lindsay Zano gave talking about the Cedar Mountain Formation, that is the unit that these tracks are coming out of, only they're from the Ruby Ranch member, which is just a little bit older than the rocks she's working in in the Mustn't Touch It member. So it's right here. The site's about 112 million years old. And um, so far there had only been six track sites found in the Cedar Mountain Formation before this site. And only two had been found from this Ruby Ranch member. And one of them is from Mill Canyon and the other one's actually in Arches National Park. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with this slide. You'll see it a lot tomorrow. And if you want your own personal copy, you can go downstairs and they have a stack of them you can take home with you. We're gonna be talking mostly about the Ruby Ranch here today. And these are just some of the dinosaurs that are known from the Ruby Ranch. Um, unfortunately, most of the dinosaurs known from the Ruby Ranch are known from pretty fragmentary remains. So that's why this track site's so important. It was found in 2009 by a local Moab man who was driving across a Jeep road that went through this wash where this red line is here. And he happened to look out his window of his Jeep and saw some dinosaur tracks. Um, they have been recently exposed due to the water running over the wash. They've probably been exposed for hundreds of years, but people weren't necessarily looking in the right place at the right time. So this man contacted Dr. Martin Lockley, who's here in the audience today. I talked to him about all of your, your track needs. He's the world expert. And he um, went out with this man and started investigating these tracks. So the really, really cool thing about the Mill Canyon track site is it preserves a really high density of different kinds of animals at this site. So there are 10 named ichnotaxa or tracks that we have at the site. Um, it's the most diverse track site that we have in the early Cretaceous in North America. And over 200 tracks have been mapped from the site and there are probably hundreds of more that we could easily, easily find. So this is what the site looked like in 2010. You can see the tracks exposed here in the wash. Um, most of them were just kind of scattered about. There's you know, a lot of sediment in them. There was still a lot of discovering to do, but you could see some really cool tracks from the beginning. So Dr. Lockley assembled this big international team and they decided to come out and start working at this site and documenting these fossils. So in 2013, they got a permit from the BLM and started to clean the site. So this is kind of what it looked like before they started cleaning it. And this is that same area as they began cleaning the site. And so all this cleaning that was done at this site early on was done with shovels and brooms and paintbrushes and dustpans. It was very slow work. It didn't go very quick. We don't take just a bulldozer out there and scrape off everything right away. We, we go down through it pretty slow so we don't damage anything. 
and we were able to do a lot of public tours and participation days during that time. So the public who are out enjoying themselves riding their um, ATVs or their motorbikes or jeeping would stop by and see what we were doing. So these are just some pictures here of folks working out at the site. See, little brooms, not very big tools. So this is a big tool. We didn't get to use that one very much. And folks just getting to be out there and watch us actually excavating the site, which is pretty cool. So here's Dr. Lockley's team that he was able to assemble. Like I said, it was this big international team. We had people from over seven different countries. We had folks from Korea, and we had folks from China, and folks from Poland coming out to help at this site. And um, our members of our local UFOP chapter, our Utah Friends of Paleontology, were out there helping us. So we worked and worked and worked, and were able to clean off this main exposure and find all of these tracks outlined here. So this is what it looked like in 2013. And then in 2014, we continued to clear and they did bring out a little bobcat to remove some of the areas where the soil was getting thick. Um, and we would just remove the soil part and then work the rest of it down very slowly, like I'd mentioned. So you can see that here. So we're continuing to clear this side off to look for more tracks. And this is kind of a reconstruction that we had done, trying to picture what the site would have looked like back then. All of these animals we have documented from these tracks. Big sauropods, um, hadrosaurs, big old theropods, some ornithomimids. So from looking at the rock and looking at all the tracks that we have at the site, we're able to tell that the environment was this big, shallow lake. The surface was probably undulating. It was very muddy, think cow pond, right? And a lot of times cow ponds have ponds come on them, right? Algae. And so we're able to tell that this lake would have had some of this algal mat covering it based on the texture of the rock. And looking at that rock, when you look at it in cross section, you can see fossils basically of this algae that would have coated the top of the pond. And that is what they're stepping in in the mud. And that algae is actually helping to hold the mud together when it got covered up to keep those fossils from being scoured away, helping to preserve them and kind of hold them together a little bit more. And another cool thing that we get at the site, I think I'll mention it again later, but we have some dromaeosaurs or you know Utah raptor-like dinosaurs that looked like they were slipping in the mud. So you'll be walking along out there, you look at these things and you see these big slip marks where their feet just shot out from underneath them probably, or they looks like they're slipping but we don't see any you know, bottom marks, so they must have not landed on their bottoms. They must have just slipped. <coughs> so what are tracks and how are they made? Um, tracks are made when an animal's moving through um, usually a softer sediment and their, their foot will depress the sediment. And he, that's what we call a mold here where the, the animal's stepping into the mud. The, the material they'll fill in the track is what we would call a cast. And so we get like these innies and outies when it comes to tracks. You get, sometimes you see raised tracks and sometimes you're seeing the actual impression. And what we get at Mill Canyon are mostly the impressions. So how were the tracks made? Like I mentioned, this area was a big shallow lake. So these animals were probably moving back and forth over this site to get food and water, coprolite, a big coprolite's been found at the site that did have plant material in it. And so we know they're also pooping in the water just like modern cows do. Um, they don't care about that kind of stuff. <laughs> and they're walking around and leaving their tracks. And they're probably not all on there on the same day. They're probably coming back and forth and moving over the site over several different um, days, maybe weeks, it's hard to say. And then at some point, um, an event happens, probably maybe a big rain, some sort of debris moves over these tracks and fills them in quickly, but not so quickly that it would scour the tracks up to help preserve them. And what we're finding when we are excavating these tracks is that there is kind of a, it's a fine grained sandy silt inside the tracks and it's a different kind of rock than what the tracks are made themselves. And, Sometimes it's harder and sometimes it's softer, but luckily it's easy enough to remove so that we can see the tracks themselves. So why are they important? Why are tracks important? Why do we care? Everybody just likes dinosaur bones, right? 
nobody cares about tracks. Tracks are actually the cool part. Tracks tell us a lot about what the animal's actually doing in its life, not just what it was doing when it dies. And so we can tell um, activity patterns, what the animal's doing, how quickly it's moving, um, how it walks, how it moves, how it might be carrying its weight in its body. Is it, you know, is more of its weight on the outside or the inside? Is it pigeon-toed? Is it walking straight? There's all sorts of cool things that you can tell from tracks. So real quick, I'll go over some of the different kinds of tracks that we've found at the site. Um, our big, really cool tracks are probably made by a dinosaur like the one Lindsay mentioned this morning called um, Seats, and we call the track Irena Serapis. And so he leaves these really nice, big dinosaur tracks. And then we get a dinosaur that's probably a relative of Utah Raptor. And this dinosaur's cool because she's just leaving two toes. And that's because that third toe's kind of held up with that claw that Utah Raptor's really famous for. Um, then we also have a sauropod. And it's probably something related to Brontomeris, and those tracks are called Brontopodus. That's what we call the track. So a lot of times we don't have a dinosaur dead at the end of the track series, right? That doesn't happen, unfortunately. So we often will give the track its own name. And that doesn't mean that we know exactly what kind of dinosaur made that track all the time. It's just to help with the scientific classification. So this is what our sauropod tracks look like. Here you can see a nice sauropod front foot track that kind of look like lima beans sometimes. Here's one where you can actually, I mean, you can hear when they're walking through that mud and they step in it and it squishes up. So you may ever walked in the mud and had like mud squish up through your toes. It's one of the best things ever. If you haven't done that, go find some mud this summer and step in the mud and feel it squish up between your toes. And that's what these dinosaurs are doing. They're walking through the mud. It may have been less enjoyable for them. But you can see these big muddy rims where the mud's kind of squishing up as they're stepping in it and making these little, what we're calling impact rims around their feet. So that's what this is. And one of the really cool tracks that we have at this site is where one of these big Irena Serapis tracks had gone through, this animal had walked through at one point gone on his way, did whatever he did for the rest of the day. And then an, an later, after that happened, a sauropod came through and actually stepped right into the middle of his track, which is really cool. It tells you which dinosaur came through first and which dinosaur came through second. And that's something I, I hadn't seen before, so that was kind of cool. We have another site where um, we don't necessarily always agree as paleontologists, where maybe a small sauropod was walking this way, the purple arrows kind of pointing the way that the dinosaur is moving. Um, we wonder if this dinosaur was a small sauropod or if maybe it was an ankylosaur. So we're still discussing that. Um, here's a site where you can see a big hind foot with these toes, and then there's a front foot, and you can see these animals are going in different directions. We also have ornithopod tracks that were probably made by a hadrosaur like this guy, probably something like Hippodraco, which is found in the area. And he leaves dinosaur tracks that are kind of like the Irena serapis, but it has this kind of pointier heel here. So he looks a little different than the big meat-eating dinosaur tracks we get. That's this guy. So the Irena serapis tracks, there are you know, beautiful blonde model with his hair waving, beautiful, beautiful dinosaur tracks that everybody loves because they're so pretty. And they're really well-defined toes. You can see the claws. He's amazing. He's, he's wonderful. We have, um, I need to update that. I forgot that. We have, how many do we have in that series now? 27, 28, something like that, where we can follow his steps. And he's just taking his time really regularly. You can actually get a tape measure and measure from one foot to the next, and he's just kind of plodding along. And if you wanted to find the next one, you just get the tape measure out, measured where it should be, dig up, you know, move the sand away, and there's your dinosaur track. So it doesn't get much easier than that. So here's some more pictures. It's very nice tracks, and then they're very similar to some tracks that we see in Glen Rose, Texas. And then I had mentioned the Utah Raptor like tracks. Here's one. Here's those slip marks I was telling you about. Here's um, one of the nice tracks we get where you can see just those two toes preserved. Here's my big old foot next to one of those. Big old, big old foot. <laughs> and so 
One of the cool things about this site is we actually have two trackways, which means multiple steps in a series. So we get tracks that preserve um, three steps, and we have a trackway that preserves five steps. And these are really cool because these had only been found in Korea and China before being found here as far as trackways go. So these were the first dromaeosaur trackways that were found in North America. So people from China and Korea are coming here to see our tracks because they're that nice. We also have these tracks that are called caramel potus. They're probably an ornitho, like an ornithomimid-like track, like Ned Colbertia that we have in the Cedar Mountain Formation. Beautiful toe impressions, just like you're thinking about these little fleshy pads between your toes, and that's what's preserved here. You can see the little claws. It's basically like a giant ostrich, only with arms. And then crocodiles. We even have crocodile traces. You can see. Here's an animal that was probably laying in the mud and pushed off out into the water. And this one's, you know, about the normal size of a modern day crocodile, but they did get bigger. We also have some more interesting tracks. We have these weird little polka dots that we're not sure what they are. There's a bird track, let's see, right here. It's kind of hard to see. And then we have this kind of grawlator-like track where this middle toe is bigger than the other two toes. So unfortunately in the Moab area, we do have a lot of damage that happens to our tracks um, that people can go and visit. People will dump plaster in them. They will try to chisel them out and take them away. They'll try to take saws out. They'll try to take drills out and drill holes around them and remove them. And this actually really damages the tracks and kind of ruins the experience for everyone. So there's been a law that was passed in 2009 called the Paleontological Re Resources Preservation Act and it helps to protect fossils. And it's actually open for public comment right now. So if you went to this regulations.gov and typed in one of these two things, you can leave a comment on it. You can read the rule and give us a comment and tell us you like this part or you don't like this part or you really hate my talk and you take it off of the screen. <laughs> that bad. But so that's a law where you can go, sorry, I've upset the gods. <laughs> Um, you can actually go online and, and read and see what the law says and make comments about it if you want to see it be stronger, or you want to see it, um, you know, if you think something's more restrictive. You can go there as a public citizen up till February 6th and leave a comment. So some of the pictures I was going to show you, I'll just kind of tell you real quick, is that one of the cool things that we've done at Mill Canyon now that Dr. Lockley's uncovered all these really cool tracks is that we wanted you, the public, to be able to go and see these things. So we built a trail to where you can walk down this trail to see these dinosaur tracks, and we built a raised boardwalk out of wood that you can walk along, you can take a stroller, and get just a little elevated to where you can look down on these tracks and actually see them in place. And we have signs that you can walk around. If you have been downstairs, you may have met artist Brian Ng. He did a lot of the artwork that we have at the site as long as a, um, an artist named Matt Kleski did some of the art as well. So we've tried to put in a lot of interpretive displays that talk about the different tracks and kind of tell you what you're seeing there so that um, you can enjoy it and you can understand which track you're seeing and why they're important. There we go. So I'll show you some pictures real quick. We were talking about um, problems with tracks. This is what happens when people pour plaster into a track. It really is hard to get out and it can actually damage the track when you're removing it. Um, at the Mill Canyon site, it's actually had some silicone poured into it, which has damaged the tracks just a little bit. You can see the splash marks here from the silicone. Here's one where some uh, silicone was poured in it and then removed, and you can still see a little bit of the damage still today from that. It did stay in the rock and damage it. So real quick, I'll get to the picture. So we did, one of the cool things that we did do at this site to help preserve the tracks is that we did something called photogrammetry, which meant we basically walked along and took overlapping photos of the entire site. And we took something like 200,000 pictures of the site, which then we were able to turn into a 3D model um, to where we can zoom in on it, all the little tracks and we can share this with people all over the world. So if they can't come to the site, they can still study the tracks. So here's another picture of that. So this is what we thought the site would look like when we first started working on it. We started building it. We had a fire crew come out and help, and our UFOP crew came out. We, we basically just started building these boardwalks. Here's what the first section looked like. 
we built some walkways, we started installing signage. We really wanted the public to be able to go out and enjoy these sites. We had um, Southern Utah University come out and help build some of these boardwalks. And we put up a shade structure, because anybody who's ever been out there knows that it gets really, really hot come July. So it's nice to have a shady place to sit and take a break. This is what some of the new signage looks like to help you figure out how to get there and what it looks like when you're visiting. So we've also had all of our signs translated into eight different languages so that um, people visiting from all over the world can read them as well and understand what in the world we're talking about. Here's some of the artwork that we had done and some of the signage that we have out there. And this is what it looked like last April when it opened to the public. So this is what it looks like right now. So I hope you all will be able to come out and enjoy the site. If you're ever in Moab, please feel free to contact your BLM office down there and we're happy to get you maps or tell you where the site is or answer any questions you might have. So thank you so much. Do you have a question? Yes, at this site we have copper lights associated with the track that um, Dr. Lockley found and they're working on that currently. Yeah. So we do have copper lights at the site. How far outside of Moab? That's a great question. I forgot to mention that. So this site is just north of Moab, about 15 minutes, and it's just south of the airport. There's a sign that says Mill Canyon, and if you turn off there, the site's like, you know, just about a mile off the road. So it's very close to Moab and very easily accessible off of Highway 191. Absolutely. We yeah, there's definitely a lot that we could continue to excavate out there. There's, we know that the track horizon goes off in several different directions, but it also comes to a point where do we keep clearing it off because the minute we uncover the tracks and clear them off, they do start to deteriorate and break down. And we know that we've got this really good um, kind of demographic of what the population, the animal population would have looked like. So we haven't cleared off too much more to look for other animals yet, but Dr. Lockley could indeed do that at any time. No, actually at this point they're pretty much where they were today. I mean, they're a little different, but so these animals had probably already moved back and forth at that time and were kind of hanging out where they lived. So they're like ancestors, or not ancestors, but like cousins of each other. Okay. Yeah. Do they think they went elsewhere? Um, so they, later they think that, but these animals may have come in through Europe. They may have come over that direction. It's, it's hard to say. There's a lot of people working on that right now. Yeah. Not my area. <laughs> yes? Uh huh. Yeah, we actually clean it out at least twice a year. Our Utah Friends of Paleontology come out and help us with that about twice a year since it is still in an active wash. We do get rain, so we still do go out there with our brooms and we sweep and clean, and, and so we do that about twice a year. We're not able to shut down that wash and try to reroute it. Yeah, we don't do that because there are, um, you know, there's wildlife that live in the area and there are cattle that graze out there and stuff, so we don't block off that wash. Um, it, yeah, nope, it's, it is as nature intends it to be. Well, if anybody else has any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you out here. Thank you so much, I appreciate it.